pleasure for me to see you all at this meeting. Uh, and I have the honor of welcoming Mr. Jonathan Carroll on behalf of the Department of English of uh, Poznan College of, Par uh, of uh, Languages. Uh, I am sure that you are going to spend a very interesting hour, an hour and a half, uh, talking to a person uh, whom I have been reading for the 15 years probably, I spent many, many hours with his protagonists, with the world he created, uh, and with the special stories that he has been uh, telling. Uh, we are going to begin by presenting uh, the new book that has just uh, appeared on the market, translated by Mr. Jacek Wietecki. Um, Yes, I think I can risk saying that you are the main translator uh, into Polish. The, the last book. The, the last, last, the the last several books. <laughs> many, many books, excuse me. So, uh, first, a short conversation between the author and his translator, and then the Q&A question, uh, Q&A uh, session, sorry, when you will be able to talk to the author himself, and we have a little mm, surprise for the participants of the uh, discussion, uh, for people who are going to ask questions. So uh, go ahead when you're ready. Yes, it's over to you. Yes, hello, Jonathan. <coughs> uh, uh, the Crow's Dinner, this, this book is different from all the others you, you, you've written earlier. It's, uh, it's uh, your, your, your American publisher, calls it wide-ranging spiritual autobiography. You call it the map of me. What's, what's the deal here? All of us every day have experiences, some of which we take in and some of which we just reject because they're so common and we're just, you know, you walk the dog, you've done it a thousand times, you don't think about it. Once in a while you walk the dog and something wonderful and magical happens. And to me, what I was trying to do with this book was to capture those moments, which I call small magic, in, in little doses, 200 words, 300 words. I'm used to writing novels, which are 100,000 words long. These things are very short. You can read them on your phone in two minutes when you're on the subway. And uh, to me, what I'm trying to do is say to you, this is the magic that I see in the everyday, and I want you to start thinking about the stuff that's magic for you. Where do you take the notes? Do you, do you keep your note, aha? Uh -huh? I think, that, I think that, that, that's, that's the best place for it. I mean, you know, once in a while I'll scribble down something, but when I see a two meter tall, 150 kilo guy dressed as Santa Claus, I remember it. And then, you know, later on I'll write it down. How truthful do you think your account is? Do, do you, uh, you know, uh, uh, embellish it a little bit to make it more interesting for the reader or do you try to stick to the facts as you as best you saw them probably 95 percent true um i i, I there's, there's a little bit of, of, of fiction in this in, in this book but but most of it is is everyday realistic my life my world mm -hmm. now the uh, the dust jacket has been designed by writer carol your son. How, how, did, how did the collaboration begin? Could you, could you tell us about it? He's, he's designed the last five covers for me for, uh, for Rebus. And what's, he's a graphic artist. He lives in New York. And some of you may know my son because he, he invented something called Bullet Journal, which is very popular now world, all over the world. I, we just see things the same way. And I say, uh, you know, I've got this book. And he says, let me read it. And he reads it. And then he does a cover. And I usually go, oh, that's good. Let's do that. The, the, the interesting thing about this cover is that, that it's very strange. Those of you, it, on top of it are two crows. And below is an old guy drinking something. And um, when it was submitted to the American publisher, they hated it. They said, do another one. When it was submitted to the, to the polls, they said, it's great, we love it. And I told the Americans, you've got to use this cover because the reaction is just terrific. And, and so far, people have been, wow, it's terrific, wonderful, marvelous. So once again, I think he's, he's captured what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. yes, the, the, uh, the volume gathers uh, a wide variety of, uh, I don't know, little genres. It's hard to even call them genres. These are pieces of autobiography, uh, recollections, uh, observations, chance encounters, uh, poems, short stories. It's a, it's a mixed bag, right? 
It is a mixed bag, and I think that, that that's, that's what makes it a, a, an okay book. You know, if it was just, this is what I see, this is what I do, it would be less interesting. And hopefully when people, what I would like if you read this book is read around in it. You don't have to go from page one to page 200. Just pick it up and open it up anywhere. And um, if, if, you, if I succeed with this book, the thing that, that succeeds is that you go, I know that kind of feeling, I know that kind of moment, I know that kind of thing, so that we can share something that normally would just be very private and mine. But when I talk about a, a funny looking guy walking a dog on the street and I go into it, you'll say, oh yeah, I once saw a funny looking guy walking down the street with a dog and, and you know, the, the, the two experiences will be shared. Mm -hmm. So a, a funny looking guy walking a dog is, is often a, a trigger for a short story or a, well, It can be. Yeah. It can be. Um, with, with you, it starts with an image or a phrase or a character. What's the, what's the first uh, impulse? When I, whenever I write, when I write a novel, I know I can write the book when I know the first sentence or I know the title, and then I just write it. Um, with these things, it was just, they came to me whole. And a lot of the time what I would do is they would be my warm-up. I would do them when I sat down in the morning and I was just getting ready to write the big stuff. And um, some of you are familiar, I have a Facebook page which has a lot, of, a lot of followers on it. And what I started doing normally on the Facebook page is every day I would post three photographs and three quotations from different writers. And then I started writing these short pieces. So in between them I would stick one of these things. And the reaction was so positive and so strong that I thought, oh, you know, maybe we should make a book of it. Mm -hmm. One of my personal favorites was the it was called Notes from a uh, Notes from a Notebook. It was just a four or five very short statements, uh, one of which is on the back cover of the uh, Polish edition, which reads: uh, "The question is uh, simple but essential. What have you added to this world?" That's your question for, that's your homework for that's today, homework students. For what have you added to this world? Yeah. <laughs> that's it. So go home and do your homework. Do some thinking about it. Yeah, I, and you know, everybody has this kind of, you know, every once in a while some great idea or image or sentence comes to you and, and too often we don't write it down or we don't remember it and it just flies away with wings. And so to me, notes from a notebook, or whatever that's called, is just me scribbling down stuff that suddenly struck me. I thought, oh, that's an interesting idea. I'll put it down. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> these, these additions to the world, they needn't be like huge or big. No. You, 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 you often talk about you know, making small contributions in your own small way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that everybody in, in this world wants magic. You know, the, the perfect love, lots of money falling from heaven, <laughs> full grades when you don't have to study, you know, but that doesn't happen. It, it, lucky you if you have the perfect love come around the corner and there they are. What normally happens is the small magic. For example, you know, you'll see something wonderfully funny on the street or you'll, you'll see something beautiful. I'll give you an example. Um, I once saw this beautifully dressed woman in Vienna walking down the street on a rainy day and then I looked over here and there was this giant dog running full speed, completely wet, completely dirty. And I went, uh-oh. And the dog ran to the woman, and instead of screaming and yelling, she went like this and embraced the dog and kissed it and hugged it and got filthy, dirty and rainy and wet. And I said, I got to write that. It's one of the pieces in here. Another one is called Furnishing uh, a Story. And you compare, uh, you compare writing a new story to uh, furnishing an apartment, and it's a, it's, it's a beautiful recollection. Could you tell us about it, how you first uh, went and checked up on your new apartment, and how it... Yeah, I, I, I had, some years ago I moved to a new apartment, and I live in Vienna, and it's, uh, it's, it, it's kind of interesting to move into a new apartment when it's completely empty. I'm sure some of you have had that experience. No furniture. It's almost like it's got the ghosts of the people who lived there before, but you're going to move in there and, you know, soon the furniture will come and you'll fill it up with your life and this and that. But I remember very clearly that day going into the living room 
and sitting on the floor and just kind of looking around thinking this is where my life is going to be for the next however many years and, and thinking you know what am I going to put here what am I going to put there and, all. and then when I was writing this book I thought that that's like that when you start a new novel or a short story you have a piece of white paper in front of you and kind of some vague ideas in your mind about the characters and the situations and all that stuff and then you have to v gradually furnish that room with the stuff that, that matters to you and is in your imagination. And, to, and I find that the, 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 the comparison between the two almost exact. Furnishing a house, furnishing your, your creativity. And a blank page. To be yeah, exactly. Yeah, but the, <coughs> as you, as you uh, create a new novel, the, the space of possibility, so to speak, narrows down, right? So yeah. at first, it's almost infinite. You can you can make just about any story that strikes you as funny or original or whatever, but when you three quarters into a new novel, you, you have to somehow, you know, tie it up, right? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the limit, you know, Jack died on page seven. You can't have Jack eating pizza on page 200. You know, there, there's that part, but there's also, the, there's a kind of magic which comes when you write a long, long piece. I remember some of you probably have read my book, Land of Laughs, and for those of you who haven't, I'm giving away a secret. In one, in about the middle part of the book, a dog talks. And that changes everything. And I remember very, very clearly, I wasn't much older than you guys, when I wrote that, I was writing along, and then, 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 the, then the dog talks. I went, what the fuck? <laughs> the dog talked? Okay. And then, you know, I continued on. I had no, I, no idea that that was going to happen. The guy goes into a room and there's a dog sleeping and then suddenly the dog goes, blah, 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 and he looks like this and I went like that too. And, and it was, you know, it, there's, a, there's a narrowing, certainly, but there's also an opening up as, as the possibilities of the situation arise. And that can come very late in something, in a book. Um, so that, that was a game changer for you. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And, and what's, 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 that book has sold lots of copies. And when I, when I finished writing it, I had a friend who was a very, very famous writer. And I asked her, would you please read the manuscript before I send it out to publishers? And she said, sure. She read it and she had one comment, lose the dog, especially the talking dog. And what's so funny about that is that the talking dogs has made my career. I mean, that's what everybody likes about, you know, my books are so weird and kids fly and dogs talk and people float around. <coughs> but if I had followed her advice, I'd have this love story about this guy who's writing, you know. Bad advice, bad advice. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, the first two editors didn't particularly like, like, like you said, they rejected the manuscript just yeah. out, of, out of hand. Now the third editor kind of liked it, right? And it, the, the novel finally got published. Yeah, yeah. It didn't, it didn't do well when it came out. That the, it was rejected by two publishers. One of, them <laughs> one of them said, I'm not brave enough to publish this book, even though I like it, which is a strange comment. Um, but the third guy said, yes, you have to do some fixing on it, but yes, I like it. Let's publish it. It came out and it disappeared immediately. And then, in English, you call word of mouth people who read the book started talking about it to each other. You hear you, you know that experience. You read a book, you love it. You give it to your friend and they like it and, you know, or music, whatever. Um, and, and that's what made the reputation. And, uh, but what, what's interesting is the biggest explosion of the book happened here in, in Poland. Um, the story, it's a long story, but I'll, I'll make it as short as possible. I used to be a teacher. I used to teach literature at the International School in Vienna. And one of my students, was Tomasz Lem, Stanislav Lem's son. And I didn't know Stanislav Lem's work. And somebody said to me, oh, you're teaching Tomasz Lem. His father's really famous. You should read his book. So, OK, I read it. And I read Solaris. I went, oh, my god. And then I went to, to Tomasz and, and, and said, I read Solaris. It's wonderful. And he said, I just read your book, Land of Laughs. Can I give it to my father? And, and I was kind of, uh, OK. And I gave the book to, the, to, to Stanislav Lem, or Thomas gave the book to Stanislav Lem. He liked it a lot. 
and he gave it to the magazine Fantastica here, and that just exploded. There, there was something like 100,000 copies went out immediately, and that's where the, 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 the since then, Land of Laughs is all over the world and blah, 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 but it was here that it started, and that's why I, I'm always so appreciative to the Poles, because they were the ones who saw what I was doing and said, it's, it's really good stuff, you know, hooray. Yeah. So Stanislav Lam published a, a, a volume of letters where he mentions you. Oh, really? Yeah, in, uh, it was either 1980 or... A while ago. Yeah, so you, you, you apparently you gave him a, a, a reading tip. He should, he, sh he should definitely read, a, 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 I'm probably gonna, gonna butcher the name, Baron Corvo? Yeah. Baron Corvo, yeah. a very weird novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Lem was funny because he's one of those people, th you guys are in translation school, you know that feeling where you can either read a language but you can't speak it, or you can speak the language but you can't read it? Lem was always saying to me, I read English easily, but I speak guerrilla English. And, and he did, he, it, 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 it was like that. So we, whenever we would meet for coffee or something like this, he would immediately say, forgive my guerrilla English. I go, okay. And then we would have our conversation. But it was so funny because this was Stanislav Lem who's saying, you know, I have terrible English. I, yes, master. So now you've been living in Vienna ever since. It's, uh, it's more than 27 years. 40. How, how, how has Vienna changed in the, in the meantime? A lot it's, of you know, it's been, recently it's been named the, uh, the, the world's uh, most uh, comfortable or uh, the city with the highest quality of life in the world. I, Vienna has a lot of McDonald's now and a lot of Starbucks, but generally speaking, it's pretty much the same. The, the Viennese are, are very much the same as they've always been. Um, it's, a, it's a city where not a lot happens, but it's really beautiful, and there's a quality, there's a quality to the coffee, there's a quality to the food, there's a quality to, to living, which is very, very you know, special and great. Um, I left Vienna in the, in the middle 1990s to go to Hollywood to write films, and I was there for two years, and I missed certain things that I didn't even know that I would miss about Vienna, and after two years I said, I, I don't want to do this anymore, and I moved back to Vienna. A couple of times you mentioned small side street shops, stores selling merchandise nobody ever buys. Are they still left in Vienna? Yeah, the yeah they are. I, I was looking when I was driving, riding through Poznan, and you see these little tiny stores with very old writing on them, and they sell umbrellas, or they sell underpants, or they sell stuff that nobody buys. And, and I love those stores because I always wonder, how do they survive? How, you know, who buys an umbrella, and if you buy an umbrella, you buy one every 50 years, but this guy's had this umbrella store or this underpants store. There's a store in Vienna that sells only old women's bras. And, and I, every time I walk by it, I go, I have never seen a woman in there. They have never changed the window. This store's been here for at least 20 years. Who comes here? And unless the woman, you know, owns it or she buys her own bras, it's, it's magic. And if, and if you do enter one of these shops, they don't the, like the, you. Own, the owner uh, is either absent or he can't be bothered. Yeah, he hates, he hates he having hates, you there. He hates customers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really a strange thing. And I, I think maybe it's a, it's a secret club. Maybe they're all spies. You know, the bra store woman is the head of the KGB in Vienna. You know, that's really what's going on. Yeah, maybe that's a, that'd be a good story. Comrade Uyushka. Uh, Mr. Morris Brown, why, why is he important? When I was young, I was a complete failure at everything except fighting. I loved to fight. And my parents got very afraid that I was going to turn into a criminal. So they sent me off to this very, very tough private school in Connecticut, which I was there for three years. And I failed everything. I just kept failing and failing, and I hated it. It was terrible. It was, uh, at the end of my time there, I have no idea why, but I sat down and I wrote a story, a short story about an old woman and a dog. I don't know, I, to this day, I don't know where it came from. And very, very shyly, I went to my teacher, Mr. Morris Brown, 
my English teacher, and I said, Mr. Brown, I wrote this story. Would you read it? And he looked at me like I had two heads. He said, you, Carol, you wrote a short story? I went, yes, Mr. Brown. <laughs> and so this was in the morning. That, the, 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 the school was a boarding school. You lived there. And I remember very well walking to dinner that night there was another, you know, the building for dinner was down there. Walking to the dinner t eating place, and behind me I heard, Carol! Carol! I went, oh, sh shit, what do I do now? And I turned around, and Mr. Brown is running, running, and he's not a young man, holding papers in his hand. He goes, Carol, this is a great story. This is a very great story. That was it. I was a writer. That's the story. Mr. Brown. It wasn't such a good story, though. <laughs> he thought so. Uh, has anyone ever uh, approached you with a proposal to write your biography, Jonathan? Yes. What was your answer? No. <laughs> why, why, my, li my, life is my, my life is mine. You know, you're not allowed to know my secrets. You can read this. That's as close as you're ever going to get to who I am. Uh, I, think, I think that so one, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Canadian writer named Mordecai Richler who's a really good writer. Mm -hmm. Mordecai Richler said, no one should ever write or read a biography of a writer because they're either one of two things. They're boring. They sit at their desk all day and write. Or they're complete failures at everything. They're drunks. They beat their wives. They kick their children. So... Who wants to read about a guy who kicks his children? Who wants to read about a, a woman who sits at her desk for 40 years and writes? They're boring. They're, you know, these are books that you don't want to read. So autobiographies are even worse because it's like, this is me, aren't I great? And you know, that doesn't work for me. OK, I'm going to open it now up to uh, Q&A, question and answer. If you have uh, any question, feel free to. I won't do your homework for you, but you can ask other questions. Kasia, I'm sure you have a question. Yes, I have a couple, actually. Uh, well, you kind of answered one to a certain extent, but I would like you to tell a little more about that. You said that you can start writing when you know the title of the book, and when you have the, the first sentence. But uh, I'm getting the impression that, although you did mention that you have a vague idea of the story, Sometimes surprise you. Always. They always do. I mean, the, the, it's very rare in writing a book that, that something doesn't happen that, that stops you. You know, the character dies or the character says, I don't want to do that to you. John Fowles, the English writer, once said he knew that he was writing well when his character started to disagree with him. And I think that that's really valid. You know, uh, uh, I remember many times when, when I was writing something and I would I would put something down and, and the, either the story or the characters would go, no, we're not going to do that or I don't like th that direction. You've got you know, to change and you've got to go someplace else. Um, and most of the time, you, have, you should follow its advice because what you're trying to do is, is, is not going to get you to a good place. It may get you further in the story, but at one point you're going to say, ah, that doesn't really work. I'm going to have to go back and change my direction. So yeah, there's, there, there can be a lot of surprises when you're writing a 300-page book. It's amazing that what you're saying is that you cannot control your characters. No. They begin to control the characters. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think I, that's the fun part, too. I mean, you know, you're, you're writing a you're writing a story about somebody who's, who's madly in love with someone, and then suddenly they go, I don't like them anymore. And, and you as the writer go, what? And they'll tell you, you know, in what they do or what they say, why this relationship has failed. And you either have to accept it or you can fight with them. I've, I've fought with my characters more than once. I go, come on, you got to... And the character will, you know, more often than not say, no, this doesn't work. I don't love them. Fix it. And on, you do. You fix it. That I've ever created? 
That's a tough question. It's a good question. It's a tough question. Um, <laughs> I like the, the character of Harry Radcliffe in Dog Museum I like a lot because he's very much like me. So the book was really easy to write. I would just, Harry would just talk like I and think like I and all this stuff. Um, but the, the characters that I love most in my books are the women because they're strong and they're, they, they're courageous and they, um, they do things that, that are braver than me a lot of the time. I'm thinking about Arlen Ford in, from the Teeth of Angels. This is a woman who, who, who con uh, conflicts with death and she fights him. She says, no, I'm not gonna take, you know, I'm not gonna take your penalty. And so in that sense, I, I mean, I love Arlen for her bravery. I like Harry because he's easy to write. You know, the, the, it's different characters for different situations. It's a good question. In Poland, you guys have good, you guys have good taste. Um, <coughs> yeah, um, actually, no, because the only thing that I can, I can sort of put my finger on is that you have a you have a, a history of, of wonderful, fantastic writers. You know, you, you have Lemon, you have Bruno Schultz, and you you have uh, you know some other people that that deal in a kind of magical darkness and, and, and possibility and all this stuff. And I think that one of the things that, 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 that I've, I've heard m more than once when I come here and I, and I see it elsewhere in the world is part of the pop, my, po the, my popularity here is because kids started the popularity. And, and I've seen this very often in other countries too. When you guys and younger start reading the books and liking them and giving them to your friends. It's almost electric. It's almost viral, like on the internet. Um, older people read a book, oh, I liked it. They may tell their friend, they may not. But kids have this incredible enthusiasm and they'll say, oh, it's wonderful, you know, and they give it to five friends and this and that. So for example, with Land of Laughs, I, from what I understand at the time that, that it was first published in Fantastica, Fantastica was really cheap magazine to buy. So you could go out and buy three copies and give them to your friends and say, you have to read this. And, Fanta and Land of Laughs was the, the book that, that, that made me very popular in, in, in Poland. And I have a feeling it might have been the young, young people who, who started the wave. Uh, but I'm, I'm not positive. Um, well, it depends on, on you know, writers are, are influencing you all your life. I mean, th I, there are writers who are, who are affecting my, my writing today. When I was young, J.D. Salinger, Catcher in the Rye, because it was so honest. You know, it was about a kid and I was a kid and, you know, I read that at a time when I was very vulnerable and the kid in the story is very vulnerable and I went, wow, you know, he's me. Um, there's a book that's not, not, I don't even know if it's published anymore, called A Separate Piece by John Knowles. It's another novel about a young kid, Good Times, Bad Times by James Kirkwood. I was reading these books when I was the same age as their, their characters, and it was magical because of the fact that, hey, there are books that talk about a life that I know. And in that sense, I was talking to, 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 uh, to one of my people the other day, and they said that, the number one book in Poland right now is 13 Reasons for Why, you know, the, the girl suicide book. And I can fully understand that. You know, it's, 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 there are a lot of kids who are, I mean, I taught teenagers for many years. A lot of, a lot of kids are, are in crisis and, and it, it's, it's, it's a tough time to go through. And so to suddenly someone says, you got to read this book, it's about us. Um, th whether it's the writer or the book or the time that you're reading it, uh, that, that can be most important. So, for example, if I say to you, 
J.D. Salinger, I read Salinger a couple of years ago and eh, I didn't like him so much. Right. But when I was six, 17, boom. Uh, when I was 25, a, a, Polish, uh, a Canadian writer named Robertson Davies had a huge effect on me. When I was 45, uh, you know, somebody else, it changes. Or, or else, or else you, 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 you're different, and so you need different stuff. I mean, I know that there was a time when I was reading the Russians, uh, the dark Russians with a 500-page suffering and all this stuff. I loved it. <clears throat> Crime and punishment, couldn't put it down. A few years ago, I tried to read a Dostoevsky novel. I threw it across the room. You know, c'est la vie. <clears throat> if if somebody if, if a kid asked me what book to read now, I would I would tell him to read Shantaram by Gregory Roberts, which is a big fat now it's been translated into Polish. Um, it's a big fat adventure novel and it's just like eating big chunk of chocolate cake. It's, it's so real and so amazing and so full of adventures. It's like the Arabian Nights today. And what, what more fun is there than reading a book that you cannot put down? And, you know, if, if you like to read, that's one of the great joys of it. it. It lives with you for, you know, days or weeks or even months. I think that you can answer that yourself. You know, when you're walking down the street on a Sunday and you see two lovers and they're just crazy about each other and then some old woman walks by them and goes ah, 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 ah. and the reaction of the two lovers is either funny or sad or beautiful or whatever, you see that, that little moment, that, that small magic that I call it. What I do is I, I take it, I take it home, and I think about it, and I say, how can I express this in a way so that I can share my own emotion towards that event with you reading it six months later, 6,000 kilometers away, you're 20 years younger, la, 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 la. I got to do it right. Now, that's, that's my job. For you, all you got to do is see it and remember it. You know, and you do see these things all the time, but they're <clears throat> we just dismiss them. You know, oh, that old woman, she's an idiot, you know. But the interesting thing is how the, the lovers react. It's not how the old woman reacts. Um, I'll give you, <clears throat> I'll give you an, an example. On the plane from Vienna to, to Warsaw a couple of days ago, I was sitting next to this kind of nice-looking woman, and she... Uh, Nothing special. And the stewardess came down the, <coughs> the aisle with the drinks. She said, what would you like? And the woman said, coffee and a tea. I've never sat next to anybody who wanted a coffee and a tea. Boom, boom. The stewardess had not even <coughs> gotten two steps down. She said, could I have another? You want another coffee and a tea? Yes. Boom, boom. Two steps more, could I have another? <clears throat> That's six cups of drink in 30 seconds. And I said, I gotta write this. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. So in a sense, you're, you're freezing moments for, yeah. for other people to, to sort of uh, look and, and make, make them see. One of my, reader, one of my readers <clears throat> called them soul snapshots, which I think is a nice way to, you know, a little bit of soul in these, these frozen moments. <clears throat> Have you ever written uh, uh, anything that was too scary or too uh, crazy? 
for you to so you you remove you, you self censored you you removed it. I've, I've written some pretty angry letters to people, but nothing <laughs> nothing creative. Um, long time ago, a long time ago, I was offered a, a giant amount of money to write a horror novel. Oh. You know, and the the the. The, the restriction was it has to be at least 500 pages long and it's got to have blood on every other page. And they, the, the money was crazy. And, and, uh, and I thought about it and I thought, it's going to take me at least two years to write this, maybe three. And that means that I have to sit down every day and have people cut and stabbed and chopped and horrible. And I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. And, and I don't like horror films and I don't like horror novels. and. Stephen King is a friend of mine, but I've told him more than once, I said, I can't read your books. I just cannot read those books. They're just too horrible. Um, there's enough horror in the world, you know? So for me to consciously try to create something that either scares you or disgusts you or whatever, to me, it's, it, I, I don't want to be disgusted. I don't want to be scared. So, you know, why share that? Zurich. <laughs> Zurich. Um, what do I like? I, I, I like that. The, I, I always say to people they, who ask me, they say, why, why are you so you know, enamored of Poland? I say, because when I come here, there's an energy. People are, 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 are trying to do stuff. They're, they're, they're alive. And it reminds me of in ca at California and Berkeley in the 1960s when there was the anti-war movement and the and there's all this energy to, to change things and get it done. And when I come to these cities, I mean, I, I'm, I was in Poznan, I think, two years ago, and there's five new buildings, you know, and, and I live in a town where there are no new buildings. And, and in America, there are new buildings, but there's also crime, you know, so there's this kind of trade-off, whereas here, there's a kind of pure energy, and, and people are excited, and they come to these meetings, and they want to talk, and they have 10,000 books to be signed and all this stuff, and it's all passion. And I feel a kind of, of, of a warm passion among the Polish people um, that I don't really feel elsewhere. So I've, in the last couple of years, I've stopped going out on book promotions, but whenever they ask me to come here, I always say yes. Is there anything that you dislike? That I don't like? I, I, I have this Facebook page where I, I, there's, there, it's very popular, and I get comments from a lot of Polish men that are stupid. You know, like I'll post a picture and some guy says something dirty about it, or, and it's almost always Polish men, and I never understand that. You know, it's either smart ass or it's dirty or it's, it's mean, and you know, I take, you know, I take it off and all this stuff, and I go, what's the problem? You know, like you'll have a picture of a woman in lingerie looking wonderful, and some guy says, oh, I'd like to get her. You know, and it's like, oh, come on. And it's almost always Polish men. That I don't like so much. But you have some male readers as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, what's interesting is that, is that the readership is different all over the world. I mean, in Poland, it's mostly female, and it's of a certain, about from 18 to 40, generally speaking, from what I can see. In, in uh, Germany, it's, it's much older. In Japan, it's all punks. Um, in, in, in England, it's a, it's a ride, wide variety, and it's always interesting to me because it's like, why does this group like it there and this group like it there and all this? I mean, there's no explaining it. I, I'm just grateful that these people, you know, enjoy it. Yeah. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Yeah. A moment ago, um, uh, and then you, you came back to Vienna. Why? What happened? How, how did you feel? I like I like California, but it's very superficial. I mean, you know, the everything is sunny and beautiful, and everybody's pretty, and all the, the you know, the movies and uh, but there's a kind of s thinness to it. You know. Uh, uh, Every, everything is great, and it's wonderful, and it's terrific, and, and it, it's not. You know what I mean? It's, everything is in superlatives, and people tell you you're the greatest writer who ever lived, and my God, you know, we're going to make you rich and all this stuff. And after a while, you start to, gee, I must be wonderful, you know? And where, 
I realized in the two years that I was there that I was, I was a book writer who was writing movies, but I was slowly becoming a movie writer who sometimes wrote books. And I, I asked myself, what's more important to me? And, and the, the, the thing about a movie, for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a collaboration. You write a script, then it goes to actors, then it goes to producers, then it goes to directors, then it goes to the company. And what you wrote usually gets picked apart like food. You know, I, I don't like this part, and I don't like this part, fix this part, change that part. And so a lot of the time what you originally came up with um, is, is, is lost, and it's very disheartening. Whereas with a book, you wrote it, whether it's good or it's bad, that's what you wrote. And that to me was most important. No, I think that to me, I don't write a book until something comes to me, a character comes to me, or an idea comes to me, and I say, I think I want to develop that. So for example, I wrote this book called Bones of the Moon, and Bones of the Moon became a book because I, I thought of the first sentence, and the first sentence in English is, the axe boy lived downstairs. Uh, that, that sentence just came out of the blue to me one day, and I thought, who says this? Where are they? What are they doing? What is their life? Who's the axe boy? Blah, 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 blah. And then the story started to, 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 de to develop. So in that sense, it wasn't like I thought about that thing out there. It came to me, but only a fragment of it. Um, when a fragment comes, it's, it's interesting enough for me to go, hmm, then I, that's as close to that experience as, as I, can, I can describe. But uh, I've never thought I would love to write a big love story or um, there's one big story that's waiting for me but I'm not ready to write it yet. No, I've never had that experience. Novels defy categorization. I think, uh, you know, you they, they reflect your uh, the books you you read, you have written. And you, 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 you pretty much you never know what you're gonna write next. In, in what genre? You, you, you don't care. Basically. No, no. I mean, the the greatest advice I ever heard about writing. And I always say it to people, it's not my line, it's from the English writer C.S. Lewis, and he says, write the kind of books that you would like to read. That's the greatest criteria in the world. And those of you who are students, if you're writing papers about anything, essays, it's the same thing, same thing applies. When you're finished with your essay, step back from it, whatever language, whatever subject, whatever it is, and say, if I were to be given this paper, would I find it interesting? Would I want to read it? And a lot of the time, if you're really honest with yourself, you go, no, there's, there's problems with it. There's, there's, you know, there's mistakes or there's not good examples or whatever it is. And the same thing that is true with the books. I'm trying to write, whether I succeed or not, I'm trying to write the books that I would like to read. You know that experience when you walk into a bookstore and you see a book in front of you and you've never heard of the writer and you've never heard of the book and you pick it up and you start to read it, and it's like, I have to read this book. That, to me, is the greatest criteria in the world for, for any writer. If someone reads my books that way, they, they come across my books that way, then I've, then I've succeeded. You know, write the kind of papers, write the kind of books. Be the kind of person that you would like to meet or be friends with. It's, you know, it, 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 it comes back. And I think that, that that kind of thinking can apply to all sorts of things in life. Actually, there's a piece in, in, in the new book that, that, that's kind of about that. You, you would 
uh, give your, your students some weird topics for essays. Like the, the day I died, was it? After I died. The, huh? After I died. After I died. My, my students <clears throat> were always confused by me because I would say to them, for example, I taught creative writing for many years, and the first assignment that would be after, here's your first line, after I died. Explosion. What do you mean? What's go uh, 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 uh. I said, after I died. That's your first, well, we don't know what to write. I said, that's your problem. <laughs> I just gave you your first sentence. And they go, well, well, can we do anything? I said, yes, you can. Right? Anything that you want using that as a, what about I'm, well, what if I want to write about I'm a dog? I go, then write about a dog. What if I want to write about, I write what you want. I, it, was, it was, you guys, as students, you know so well that the teachers so often say to you, do this and this and this and this. And when I was a student, I hated that. I wanted my freedom. And so as a teacher, very often, I would say to the kids, I want you to take this and run with it. I'll give you another example. Um, I used to teach literature, real smart kids. And we would, once we were reading the, the short stories of Nathaniel Hawthorne, American writer, they're very difficult, they're very metaphorical, and they're hard to understand. So, so I gave the kids a, one of the stories to read, a story called Young Goodman Brown, which is really difficult. And the kids came back and they were like this. What's it about? I said, come on, don't you know? And they go, no, it's too hard. Help us. I said, okay. So I went to the board and I wrote, this is what the story's about. And I went, da 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 And all the kids went, oh. I went, you like it? They went, yeah. I went, that's not what it's about. This is what it's about. Even better. Oh, you like it? Yes. No. Boom, boom. And then I did it a third time, and, and they, at the end of it, they said, what's the goddamn story about? I said, I don't know, class dismissed. <laughs> they were so angry at me. But what was interesting was that when I walked out of the classroom, they were arguing in the hall about which interpretation fitted the story best. And I went, that's exactly what I want. That's exactly what I want. And you know, if you read my books, it's the same thing. The books are a dialogue between you and me. You may, not, you may like a character that I don't like, or vice versa, or whatever it is, but all books are a conversation between the present and the absent. And the greatest conversations are the ones in which both of you are fully engaged. I've done my part of the conversation. If you read my books, then now it's your turn. And you can hate the book, and you know, I, I, I'm sorry if you throw it across the room, but at least you gave it your full concentration, and that's all I can ask for. Some of them, some of, some of them, yeah. Um, it's so strange because once in a while, I haven't taught for, for a long time, and sometimes I'll be walking down the street in Vienna and like this 45-year-old man will come up to me, beautifully dressed, obviously very rich, and, Mr. Carroll! And I look at him and I go, Roger? <laughs> so, you know, the kid I taught in 10th grade who got a, you know, a C, is now a tycoon, he has five businesses, and stuff, but I'm still Mr. Carroll. It's very sweet, I like that. <laughs> I had a question about the reviews of your books. Do you read them? And what, if you do, uh, what was the most crazy, surprising, stupid thing that you read about your own book that you completely disagree with? Well, I get a lot of bad reviews for my books. And, but the thing that, that makes me un, unhappy about that is that very often when people give me a bad review, either in, in magazines or newspapers or Amazon.com, they don't, they don't see it. They don't get it. You know what I mean? So, for example, someone will say, oh, I liked Land of Laughs until the dogs talked and then it became stupid. Well, if, if that's how you're going to react to the book, then I can't take your criticism seriously because you have to accept the fantasy that dogs talk and you have to accept the fantasy that strange things go on. If you say it's not realistic and that's why the book fails, then that's like saying, it's like going to a Chinese restaurant ordering a steak. And they say we don't have steak or they make a bad steak. Um, what, the, the criticism that hurts is when really smart people who, who 
are, they know what I'm trying to do, and they'll point out things. They'll say, well, this character doesn't or does, and this fails and all that. Um, it's like somebody who, who knows you very well points out your, your weaknesses, you know, your Achilles heel. That's, that's hard to take. But the idiot who says, you know, I don't like your hairdo, and they have hair, you know, like this, you don't pay much attention to it. Good. <laughs> That's good to hear. Does it come that some writers that from various corners of the world uh, write to you asking, what do you mean by that? How can I translate this? Yeah, I get letters all the time from people saying, um, well, on page 49 of uh, Dog Museum, you say, rrr, rrr, rrr. And, and a lot of the time, I, I don't remember. So I have to like go and get a copy of the book and look at it and go, mm, and I wrote that book 20 years ago. I don't remember what I meant. Um, th I, I, ha I have this thing that which, as long as I'm writing the book, I'm God. I am the God of that book. But when I finish it and I give it to you, I'm just a reader of that book. Absolutely. So that my opinion is no, different from, is no more important than yours. So when you write to me and say, what did you mean by rrr, 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 I, I, I'm only reacting to you as a reader. I say, well, I, I didn't think that they needed to do that, but it's not like God, you know, God talking. It's just another reader who knows the book and says, well, when I read it, da da da. And I think that a lot of people are surprised because, you know, too many writers like to play the God role. You misunderstood what I meant. Well. I don't, I don't agree with that. I think that, that essentially, as soon as you finish it and you put it out there into the world, what you're saying is, I'm just one of you know, many people who are reading this and having an opinion or a reaction, which is no better or worse than yours. Do, do you find it hard to, to cut this umbilical cord between you and your novel as you are approaching the end of it? Sometimes it's really sad. <coughs> when you finish a book. You know, I, I, there have been times in which I get tears in my eyes when I start to write the last page because, as I've said so often, I think that finishing a book is like a woman who gives birth to a child. You know, the, that, that, there's that term postpartum depression, that depression that some women have after the child is born. It's not that they're sad that the child is there, but basically it's only been the two of you for the last nine months, and now it's out there in the world and it's going to have a life of its own. And that's kind of sad. So, I mean, if I've lived with a book for a year or two years, it's just me and the book, suddenly I'm no longer important because the book is, is floats off my desk and goes out into the world. And that can, that can be kind of sad. I, I, there's, actually, there's only one editor who, what, my, the process that I, that I go through now is that when I finish a book, I give it to one person who's a very famous editor in New York who's a, who's a friend of mine, and she's not with any ha publishing house, she's, she's independent, and she, because she's a friend, she's, she'll always read it immediately and give me input on it. And most of the time, whatever she says is, is very valid and I'll make the changes. After that, Publishers don't say anything. They say, okay, you know, I give it to the publisher and they say, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm <clears throat> there, are, there are a couple of lessons, that, uh, the, the difference between writing books and writing movies. And, and it's, I'll give you a, a simple example. In a, in a book, you can write five pages about a person who goes into a telephone booth and makes a telephone call. What does the phone booth look like? What color is it? What is he wearing? What is the weather? Blah, 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 blah. 
two pages, five pages, whatever. In a movie, guy walks into a phone booth, period, boom, that's it. Eight seconds. And it's really hard as a novelist, because most movie scripts are 90 pages. The, the rule in, in movies is one page a minute. So most movies are 90 minutes long. So the, you're, you're 80 to 100 pages. And, and most novels are, are three times that or four times that. So you've got to learn to, to condense. And that, that was probably the best lesson that I learned when I was writing movies, is, is how to, to, to tighten, in English you'd say, tighten it up. Um, and, and that I was grateful for. But, th but there are a lot of other things about movie writing that, that I didn't like at all. And it's one of the reasons why I stopped doing it. Sure. Translation is like it's like a trip inside the text, getting the meaning and circ, you know, going back up to the surface with the with the Polish, Polish uh, uh, layer. Yeah. So this 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 process of taking the plunge into the text is, is, is I find it, I find it much easier to do now than at the beginning when you were when I was sort of uh, you know uh, going. Headway, you know, uh, head first into a, 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 a unknown waters. For both of us. Yeah. <laughs> I like I, I like these short pieces because it's it's almost like I can hear you speak. Actually, sometimes I can literally almost hear your voice as I read these. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 an interesting it's an interesting book because. It's the people who have read it say it's so different from everything else that you've written. And I go, you know, don't hold that against me. Don't, don't resent it. Just take it for what it is, which is, you know, that book that has those little pieces. One of the things I love about this book is that, you, as I said earlier, you can read it in little pieces. For example, you can get, you know, on the, on the tram home today, you can read page 29 in between two stops, and you're done. You know, you know, it's not a novel where you have to turn the page down and have to remember what happened. Story, snapshot, story, snapshot, story, snapshot. And hopefully some of them are, will be the kind of thing that, that's very satisfying to you, as satisfying perhaps as a longer piece. You know, I, 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 I've been getting a lot of positive reaction from people saying, oh, I love the story of the, or, or I loved where you talked about the this and that. And that to me is, is a success. That, the book might have if it if it if it works for people. Okay. Um, All right. So thank you for making the college a, a stopping point on your map, on your current map. You're welcome. And, uh, You're welcome. Well, Do your homework. Do your homework. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Class dismissed. Thank you very much. It, uh, for me, it was absolutely fascinating to hear about the way that your stories carry you. Thank you very much for You're that. welcome. I'm gonna